Hello, everyone, and welcome to Arcade Live Game. This is the fourth video in my series about the earliest large scale conflicts between Native Americans and European colonists and colonial powers in North America, and the sixth video in my series about early colonial debacles that disprove the myth of inherent European moral and technological superiority. The subject of this video is King Philip's War, the resistance led by Medicom and Widamu against early colonial New England. <clears throat> now, as I always like to point out in my videos, whenever we hear uh, names and phrases like North America, China, the US, New England, etc., we unsurprisingly tend to think of how these regions, countries, provinces, etc., are as they are today, uh, how they are today, which is not invalid, because of course this is how we know them. These regions, countries, provinces, etc., have had their current shape and political makeup for anywhere between a hundred to thousands of years. However. This is not the full picture. These countries, regions, provinces, etc., only became the shape they are today, only took on the political makeup that they have today after a long series of events and processes. So in order to better understand how these regions, countries, and provinces became as they are today, we need to go back a little bit in time to get a look at the bigger picture. <clears throat> Which brings us to the first section of this video, the Native American tribes in New England and New England itself before European colonization. So before and during the early years of European colonization, New England and the Northeastern Woodlands was home to a large number of very diverse Native American political entities and nations. With these nations generally being be, uh, being built around uh, confederacies or leagues, i.e. a lot of um, smaller nations that work together to make a larger nation, uh, with those generally being built around great councils and other similar governmental bodies where they would generally take on, where they would generally have views and uh, morals based around placing mother nature and things like that uh, is the most important things. Um, and these societies were by far mostly matrilineal and matrifocal societies, with a matrilineal lineage being a uh, lineage where women controlled property and hereditary status is passed through the matrilineal line, which is in stark contrast to most European and Asian cultures where, it's, where the hereditary status is passed through the patrilineal line. Uh, for example, uh, I and many Euro-Americans will uh, tend to trace our family trees back from our fathers and our grandfathers on the way up, uh, and we do tend to take our father's last names. Um, that is the exact opposite in matrilineal societies like the Native Americans had and still have today, uh, where you they tend to take their mother's last name uh, and they trace their lineage from their mothers and grandmothers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then a matrifocal uh, system is the idea that when a couple marries, they live with the woman's family, which of course is again in stark contrast to Euro, to most Euro-American and Asian cultures where it's the opposite where you go and live with the man's family. Uh, also in the in matrifocal systems, women were the ones who approved, uh, women elders were the ones who approved the selection of chiefs or sachems, or another phrase is often uh, called uh, sagamores, um, rather than the men. Also, women were the ones who passed plots of land to their descendants, specifically female descendants, regardless of, ma of marital status. 
And these groups uh, tended to live in large villages, towns, and cities that tended to look sort of like this. Now, some, uh, as a historian and archaeologist who has worked in uh, the museum industry and in the field of archaeology, um, I can tell I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people watching have, when they hear the word Native American, they tend to think of like teepees and things like that, uh, which of course a lot of American, Native Americans did live in, but only in the Great Plains. By far, the majority of Native Americans societies in North America had some form of city or large scale village with the all of the villages in the Eastern Woodlands looking somewhat like this with a few variations, but generally very similar with uh, them living in some form of sort of log cabin called a log house or uh, a, a wig, not a wigwam, but a, a long house or a birch bark house or things like that. Because as you can see, these houses were built using timber and birch bark. And they were agricultural societies. They had large farms and agricultural fields, both within the limits of their cities as well as outside, where they would cultivate crops like uh, predominantly uh, corn, squash, and beans. But they would also use controlled fires to burn down uh, thing, plants and trees like pines that were uh, essentially ten, giant tinder boxes. Uh, in favor of more fire-resistant uh, nut and fruit-bearing trees, uh, such as walnut trees and oaks and things like that, that, of course, would produce things like walnuts, butternuts, acorns, uh, hickory nuts, chestnuts, etc. They would also utilize uh, maple trees for the sap to make maple syrup, which they would could use with other ingredients to make soups and things like duck broth. Uh, they would also utilize wild rice and uh, berries and things like that. And as the name of the duck broth suggests, uh, these tribes did hunt. Uh, they hunted quite a lot of wild game, such as deer, um, rabbits, uh, bear, uh, wild turkeys, various water, types of waterfowl like duck and goose and things like that. They were also very skilled fishermen. Uh, they would utilize marine food resources to large degrees, uh, either fishing, uh, catching fish either with uh, nets or baskets, uh, catching fish with spears, or building what are known as fishing weirs, which were uh, large circular or square fences or large circular or square rock walls that were would wrap around and would have a entrance that is wider in the front and narrower in the back, which would mean the fish would swim in through the front but not be able to swim out and they would get stuck and therefore essentially be very easy to catch. <clears throat> And these marine resources that the tribes in the northeastern woodlands in New England would utilize included, but were not limited to, things like eels, both salt and freshwater, various types of Atlantic fish like herring and shad and alewife, uh, lobsters. They would utilize freshwater crustaceans like crawfish or crayfish, uh, depending on what region you live in, depends on how they are, how the name is pronounced. <laughs> they would utilize uh, oysters, and both freshwater and saltwater clams. The tribes in the northeastern woodlands also had access to a, <clears throat> to a very well-developed trade network, as you can see here, where the trade goods would include things like copper from the Great Lakes, uh, marine shells from the northern and southern Atlantic coast, such as the marine shells that would be made to get used to make wampum belts. Uh, they were called wampum themselves. Uh, they would also trade for ceremonial pipes, as well as the stone that the pipes were made out of called <laughs> pipe stone. So now that that section is out of the way, it leads us now leads us to the next section. European colonization of New England. <laughs> so, colonization of New England by European powers started with the 
Dutch Republic, which um, started colonizing New England after seeing inroads into North America by their rivals, the French, British, and Spanish empires. And so, of course, the Dutch were like, well, we want a slice of the pie. So they would come and settle mainly around what is now modern-day uh, Delaware, uh, New York, uh, New Jersey, Connect and Connecticut, uh, building uh, the colony of New Netherland, uh, with the capital being New Amsterdam, and building several forts like Fort Nassau and uh, Fort Casimir and Hempstead. <laughs> but the imperial power that had the biggest impact on the tribal nations of the Atlantic coast and of New England would by far be the British Empire which would start migrating in large numbers to New England in the 1620s with over 20,000 English sailing to New England in 1620 itself. With the first colony being, that was created being the Plymouth Colony, uh, which would uh, shortly after being founded, make contact with the Wampanoag Confederacy that you see here. Yeah. Uh, and this, uh, this contact was done with the help of native translators such as the very famous Squanto, but actually uh, the individual who had the most hand in helping the colonists uh, contact the Wampanoag would be, it was an individual by the name of Samoset. Uh, and with the help of Semiset and Swanto, the colonists would be able to form an uneasy alliance with the Wampanoag Sachem, or Sachem, I've heard it pronounced both ways, Masoit, on uh, March 22nd of 1621 CE. With eventually their uh, treaty being solidified in what most people would know as the first Thanksgiving, though. Uh, as I mentioned in my video on the first Thanksgiving, which I will link in the iCard, um, the actual event was far from what people think it actually was. Uh, and in fact, after forming this uh, alliance, a rival tribe of the Wampanoag, the Narragansetts, would attack Massasoit's village in uh, Solom, uh, but the colonists would go and help the Wampanoag drive the Narragansetts back in 1632 CE. <laughs> Shortly after the Plymouth colony was founded, the another English colony would be founded called the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, which would actually have um, a bigger hand, sort of, in a lot of ways, in uh, the colonization of New England than the Plymouth colony did. Not always, but a lot of times. <laughs> Which leads us to the interim years uh, from 1632 to 1675 CE. So, with the establishment of the Dutch colonies, but also the uh, Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay colonies, uh, the North American fur trade would be established, which was mainly controlled by Native American confederacies and nations such as the Wampanoag and the Narragansett and Pequot and such, where the the Native Americans, the Wampanoag, Narragansett, Pequot, etc., would go out and hunt uh, animals such as beaver and deer, um, raccoon, etc., for their furs, where they would then take and trade with the English in return for items like gunpowder weapons like flintlocks and matchlock muskets, as well as stone implements, whether they be cooking implements or utilitarian implements uh, like hooks for hanging things. And this, the industry was very profitable for the Dutch, as I talked about in the previous video on the Dutch conflicts with Native Americans in New England, but also very uh, profitable for the British, which would eventually lead to more British immigrating into New England, which in itself led to the British population growing. Uh, and the British population would steadily grow uh, from 1620 um, 
well into the 1750s. Um, and specifically for this video, steadily grow from 1620 into the 1670s. Meanwhile, the Native American population would slowly start to decline, especially in between the 1640s, as, yeah, yeah mid-1630s, and the 1670s. The largest population growth by far for the British would be in colonies uh, such as New York, Philadelphia, and Boston, as you can see here. And with this growth in uh, colonial power uh, and decline in uh, growth in colonial population and decline in Native American population, so too came war. In fact, one of the biggest reasons for said decline in the Native American population was an event known as the Pequot War, which led to the dissolution of the Pequot Confederacy as a political entity. Now, the Pequot did not go extinct, as I mentioned in the Pequot War video, which I will also link in the iCard, but, but it did lead in a massive decline in the Native American population overall. Uh, and it would also uh, lead to a massive shift in um, the sociopolitical uh, makeup of the region. <laughs> With the main massacre in this war happening uh, at what is known as the Fort Mystic Massacre, which horrified the Native Americans because several Native American war bands had actually allied with the Connecticut and Massachusetts Bay colonies and fighting the Pequot, um, and they would be horrified when they saw the tactics that the colonists used. In fact, one of the captains responsible for the Mystic uh, Fort Massacre, John Underhill, would admit so himself, where he can see, as you can see here, mentioned how the Indians, how the Native Americans uh, <clears throat> talked about how uh, essentially, their fighting was too furious and slew too many, um, which did not, uh, which their criticisms did not please the British again. I mentioned that in greater detail in the Pequot War video that I will include in the iCard. And as a result of this war, uh, of course, many of the Pequot had been massacred, but those who hadn't been massacred or who hadn't been taken in by other tribal entities like the Narragansetts and Mohegans um, and uh, Susquehannock and other tribes uh, would then be enslaved and shipped off to Bermuda or the West Indies, or they would be forced to become slaves and servants in English households in colonies like Connecticut and the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And with the defeat of the Pequots and seeing the, uh, the being alarmed by the brutality um, and the lack of mercy shown by the British colonists in the Fort Mystic or the Mystic Fort Massacre, the Narragansett, one of the Indian allies present there, uh, the Narragansett leader specifically, uh, uh, Mian uh, Tanamo, would actually gather. Uh, several uh, Algonquin-speaking tribal nations and confederates together with the hope that they could face the colonists together much better than the Pequot had alone. But this would end in disaster as uh, the colonists still had some Native American allies, and so colonial militia, along with Native allies from the Mohegan would eventually catch up to Mian Tomo, uh, Tanamo and capture him, and Mian Tanamo would be killed by the Mohegan Sachem, uh, Sachem or Sachem Uncas, uh, which would shatter the Narragansett coalition, coalition in 1643 CE. <laughs> Around the same time, uh, the English colonies, such as the General Court of Massachusetts, would pass what is known as the uh, Act for uh, Propagation of the Gospel Amongst the Indians uh, in 1646 CE, with the idea of, of course, converting Native Americans to Christianity. 
uh, spearheading this would be several uh, missionaries, including Reverend John Elliott, who would begin Christian, uh, preaching Christianity to the New England tribes, and Elliott would eventually translate the Bible into the Massachusetts language uh, and publish it in 1663 CE as, uh, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that so as not to offend and disrespect the Native American tribes, but he published it as that. <clears throat> and so as a result of this movement to convert Native Americans to and New England to Christianity, by 1675, over 20% of New England's natives were living in what are known as praying towns that you can see here on these maps. <laughs> Uh, but despite initial, these initial peaceful con conversions, Wampanoag leaders like Massasoit, uh, his son Wamasut, and his other son, his sons Wamasut and Medicom, who I'll get to in a minute, uh, possessed a great fear that any of their people should be, quote unquote, called or forced to be Christian Indians. Uh, I.e., they were afraid that this was not going to remain peaceful for long, and that they, it was eventually going to be. Um, conversion by conquest. Um, shortly after, uh, uh, shortly, shortly after these events began to happen, Massasoit would die uh, of old age, and he would be succeeded by his eldest son Wamaset in 1661 CE. <laughs> uh, only for Wamaset to be shortly after accused of independently negotiating land sales uh, by the Plymouth Colony, and he would then be summoned to the Plymouth Colony where he was seized and placed into jail, uh, and he was questioned um, where shortly after for several weeks, I believe, and shortly after being questioned, Wamaset uh, would become ill and die in 1662 CE. Around the same time, one of the increasing conflicts or causes of increasing conflict between the Wampanoags and the settlers uh, was the continual intrusion of settlers' livestock onto Wampanoag farms and food stores, uh, something that very few colonists uh, took any attempts to prevent, and even the ones who did take steps to prevent, they only took half-hearted steps. Uh, and this was, of course, in spite of regular complaints by the Wampanoag. Tensions would then further rise as colonists would uh, periodically come and either try or succeed in confiscating Native American rifles. Now, of course, they didn't confiscate them all, but they would periodically come and take some, you, and then come back and take more, and you can sort of get the pattern therefore leaving the Wampanoag and other New England Native American tribes with less and less of a, an ability to defend themselves <laughs> or to hunt for furs. Now, uh, now that we've got that out of the way, uh, one of the, one, we, we need to move on to two of the, the two major figures of the, the who rose during this intermediate, this interim intermediate period. The first being Witamu. <laughs> so Witamu was a woman who was born to the uh, Pocasset tribe of the Wampanoag Confederacy in 1635 CE. And here are, is their um, homeland here. And throughout her life, she would have five husbands, including Wamaset, uh, the eldest son of Massasoit. And after Wamaset's death, she would remarry to several other individuals, finally, who all would die in quick succession uh, or divorce. They would divorce in quick succession as well, finally ending in the, her final marriage with Quinnipin of the Narragansett which would actually be a political marriage that would greatly strengthen the relationship between the uh, Narragansett and the Wampanoag. <laughs> and because her father had no sons, 
uh, to inherit his title, uh, Widamu became what is known as a Sulk Squaw or a female Sockham or slash Sachem, uh, making her an incredibly influential and powerful figure in the region, commanding an army of more than 300 warriors uh, to help fight in any conflict that she and her allies need them for. <laughs> and one of her closest allies would become an individual by the name of Metacom, who would rise to power in between 1662 and 1665 CE. <laughs> so Metacom was the youngest son of Massasoit, uh, and he would succeed his brother Wamasutta as Grand Sachem or Sachem of the Wampanoag after Wamasutta died in captivity at the hands of the Plymouth of the at the hands of the Plymouth colonists. <laughs> And due to the continual grievances at the hands of the colonists, as well as fear that the Wampanoag might eventually suffer a similar fate to the Pequot, Metacom began negotiating, also known as Metacomet, began negotiating with other Algonquin tribes, uh, planning to form a large confederacy against the uh, Plymouth colony, with Widamu, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, being his closest ally. And these negotiations would happen uh, between uh, starting in the winter of 1674 and would last through 16, the winter of 1675 CE. Uh, but of course, these efforts would not go unnoticed, and eventually a Christian convert, an, a, a Native American Christian convert by the name of John Sassamon, would hear about these plans uh, and would report Medicom to the uh, Plymouth officials, where uh, Medicom would then be brought to trial, where the court officials actually admitted that they had no proof uh, of these claims that John Sussamon had brought to them, but warned that they would continue to confiscate, uh, to confiscate uh, Wampanoag landing guns if they had any further reports that he was conspiring to start a war. And shortly after uh, the uh, Sassamon's uh, reporting of uh, Medicom's efforts, uh, John Sassamon would be found murdered in an icy pond with witnesses testifying that they had seen three of Medicom or Medicomet's men kill Sassamon and put him in the icy pond. Um, and despite Medicom's request to try the accused Wampanoag himself, the Massachusetts General Court charged and tried uh, the three Wampanoags for the murder of Sassamon, these individuals being uh, Tobias, uh, Wampapaquin, oh, uh, <clears throat> and Mata Shunamal, uh, yeah, Shunamal. Apologies for possibly butchering those names. Uh, with the jury finding them guilty and executing them. And here you see here is an excerpt of the sort of court summons that called the, these three individuals to the Massachusetts court. <laughs> Which leads us to Kings Phillips' war. So, in response to the execution, as well as the aforementioned continued grievances that were already causing tensions between the uh, New England Native Americans and the New England English colonists, Medicom and Widamu would declare war on the English colonists by launching an attack on the town of Swansea in June 20th of 1675 CE. Uh, which now leads us to, uh, before we go through look and look at the course of the war, we now need to take a look at the general makeup uh, of the uh, of the military forces of both sides and their weapons. So here on the screen, you see generally what Native American warriors would have looked like on the eve of the so-called King Philip's War, with most warriors amongst the New England Native Americans generally looking uh, some variation of like this, uh, whereas the higher-ranking warriors. Um, would look more like this individual. Uh, this is actually Medicom himself, uh, or this individual who is a uh, Mohegan chief. Um, 
And this is a what a again a general low class lower class warrior would have looked like. Though this is actually not a low class warrior. This is actually uh, Ninigret. The uh, uh, this is actually Ninigret, a I believe a Wampanoag warrior. And the weapons that the Wampanoag and other tribes of the Eastern Woodlands would have generally used would have been a variety of different types of war clubs and tomahawks, which by now had pro were predominantly made out of steel, like you see here. And then these would have been used in close range uh, to quite devastating effect. And then in terms of long range weapons, they had by now completely moved on to rifles utilizing heavily the Dutch trade guns uh, that were the Dutch flintlock trade guns. And in fact, early on in the war, for the, year, the first year or so of the war, the Confederacy, the Native American warriors under uh, Medicom and Wudemu's, uh command actually had, were actually more advanced than the British colonists. They actually had better weapons, and that's because British colonists were not, while the colonial elite were profiting off of the fur industry, the colonists themselves were not always profiting off of it, and guns were expensive. Meanwhile, the Native Americans, like the Wampanoag and the Narragansett and the Mohegan and such, would oftentimes use furs to go to other European powers, such as the Dutch and the French, uh, etc., to trade for the very valuable and very it, it, technologically advanced for the time Dutch trade guns, like you see here, which were incredibly accurate uh, and uh, had a very long shooting range and were, of course, very powerful. In contrast, this is what the British soldiers would have looked like on the eve of King Philip's War. Uh, this would have been what sort of a musketeer would have typically looked like in the British colonies. Uh, this would have been a uh, British colonial cavalryman. Uh, and this is what the officers would have looked like. And here, again, is what, what the cavalry would have looked like. And at their disposal, the British had used the same typical muskets, if they could afford it, uh, that the uh, Native Americans under Medicom and Wiedemu used, though oftentimes they still used matchlock, uh, less advanced matchlock weapons, because again, many of the colonists were not able to afford the new, more advanced weapons. Uh, and they, for sidearms, they used uh, matchlock or flintlock pistols, and up close, they used things like this typical saber of the saber of the time period that you see here. <laughs> All right, so with that, now let us move on to the course of the war itself, and the first and leads us to the next section, the Southern Theater. So, in response to Wiedemu and Medicom's attack on Swansea, the colonists would. Uh, launch a punitive military expedition to destroy that destroyed the Wampanoag town at Mount Hope and Bristol, Rhode Island uh, on June 28th of 1675 CE. Uh, and eventually the war would uh, pr very quickly spread throughout southern New England. With Wiedemu and Medicom's forces being able to successfully perform an ambush known as Wheeler Surprise, but fail, uh, but failing to take Brookfield in a siege, uh, which eventually led to both forces fighting to a draw between August 2nd and August 4th of 1675 CE. With the start of the war, uh, to, and with a very powerful, newly constructed Native American Confederacy threatening them, the various colonies of southern New England would come together to form the New England Confederation uh, in order to fight Medicom and Wudemu's Confederacy, uh, with, the, with this Confederation being formed on September 9th of 1675 CE. Uh, only for Medicom and Wudemu's forces to win yet another battle at 
uh, known as the Battle of Bloody Brook on September 28th of 1675 CE. Uh, and then also with Medicom Wigamu's forces successfully laying siege to and sacking Springfield, Massachusetts on October 5th of 1675 CE. Uh, though the New England militia was able to gain some degree of victory after they attacked the new, still, at this point in time, still neutral uh, Narragansett, who had not participated in the war, uh, at what is known as the Great Swamp Massacre on December 19th of 1675 CE. And this was a, a joint New England and allied Mohegan Pequot effort. Because remember, the Pequot, while they were dissolved as a political entity, were not extinct. Uh, Medicom, uh, during this time, in conjunction with the Narragansett being attacked, who were neutral again, being attacked by New England, and actually at this point joining Medicom's war effort in response to the Great Swamp Fight, uh, in conjunction with this, Medicom would attempt to gain the aid of the of the powerful Mohawk and Haudenosaunee Confederacy, more commonly known as the Iroquois Confederacy. <laughs> uh, but the Mohawk, uh, who were profiting far more off of the colonists than they were off of the Wampanoag, uh, would intervene actually on behalf of the colonists, launching a surprise assault against uh, a 500 warrior band that Medicom had brought with him, resulting in the death of somewhere between 70 to 460 of the warriors that, that Medicom had with him, forcing Medicom and his surviving warriors to withdraw back into New England, being pursued by Mohawk forces, who would then proceed to attack Algonquin settlements and ambush their supply parties for several weeks throughout February of 1676 CE. However, despite this setback, uh, Medicom and Wiedemann's forces would successfully, and, uh, would successfully attack and destroy many more settlements, uh, New England settlements, throughout the winter of 1675 to 1676 CE. <laughs> and here is uh, a map of the Mohawk intervention again, uh, as well as Wiedemu and Medicom's uh, continued campaigns and destruction of New England settlements. Medicom and Wiedemu's forces these campaigns would include uh, a point when Medicom and Wigamu's forces successfully raided Lancaster, uh, resulting in the death of several colonists, as well as the capture of, an, of a woman by the name of Mary Rawlinson, who we will talk about again a little bit later in the video on February 10th of 1676 CE. <laughs> and then... Uh, at, shortly after that, Medicom and Wiedemu's forces would launch the what is known as the Plymouth Plantation Campaign, where they would successfully burn down many more settlements, uh, as well as would eventually catch up to and capture uh, and torture to death Captain Pierce and his troops on March 26th of 1676 CE. Uh, with Captain Pierce and his troops eventually being laid to rest at an area known as Nine Men's Misery. And here's a plaque commemorating that that you can see here. <laughs> Other settlements in Rhode Island and Connecticut, in Connecticut, however, were able to hold off attacks, but they became still became largely cut off from the mainland. Meanwhile, smaller towns such as Northfield and Deerfield would become abandoned uh, as surviving settlers would begin to retreat to aforementioned larger towns uh, that were able to hold off to some degree the uh, attacks by Medicom and Wiedemann's forces. I... Uh, and then, shortly after that, Medicom and Wiedemann's forces would continue to win more battles, such as uh, when they won the battle known as the Sudbury Fight on April 21st of 1676 CE. Uh, but shortly after that, uh, Massachusetts Captain 
uh, William Turner uh, would uh, lead a campaign uh, consist lead a military campaign consisting of 150 militia volunteers, uh, as well as Mohegan allies, and would score several victories against Metacom and Wiedemus forces throughout the summer of May through June 1676 CE. <clears throat> uh, and eventually, uh, English colonists would uh, defeat. Um, Metacom and Wiedemus forces at the Second Battle of Nips uh, of Nips such uh, of yeah Nips such junk uh, in summer of 1676 CE. Sorry if, for possibly butchering that. <clears throat> Shortly after these victories, uh, Metacom would be uh, killed while he was. Um, going on a mission to gather more allies and uh, initiates to his confederacy. Uh, and then Wiedemu would uh, be drowned, it would drown in Tonkin River, attempting to escape English militia forces. <laughs> After Medicom's death, uh, John Winslow would declare a thanksgiving to celebrate the death of Medicom. Now, you'll note that Wiedemu is not mentioned, and that's because while women were important and are still very important to Native American culture, um, they are, were obviously not important to English culture, so therefore she was not mentioned. <laughs> and here, and, and this, this declaring of Thanksgiving in honor of Minicom's death is mentioned specifically in this source here, titled A Brief History of the War with the Indians in New England, uh, where you can see right here, uh, it says that on August 12th, uh, in response to uh, when Philip was thus slain, um, with five of his men killed with him, uh, the colony appointed the 7th of this instant to be observed as a day of public thanksgiving through jurisdiction. Apologies, I said August 12th, it was actually August 7th. <laughs> and that concluded the war in the Southern Theater. However, the war would continue for two more years in the Northern Theater, specifically Maine and Acadia. So upon hearing news of the Wampanoag attack on Swansea, uh, colonists in York marched up the Kennebec River and demanded that the Wabanakis turn over their gun and guns and ammunition as a sign of goodwill. In response, the Wabanakis began raiding trading posts and attacking settlers also in June of 1675 CE. <laughs> and under the leadership of Sagamore's uh, uh, Mog Hogan here on the left and, uh, and uh, Madoc uh, Kwando here on the right, the Wabanakis would then seize uh, as many uh, English sloops and ships as they could uh, and build a flotilla and would start repeatedly raiding trading posts, attacking settlers, and decimating colonial settlements throughout the region of Maine and Acadia through 1675 and all the way through 1677 CE, <laughs> with, the, with the war only ending when the Wabanakis sued for peace themselves, themselves because, of course, they won uh, the treaty, specifically uh, being the Treaty of Costco, officially ending the fighting in 1678 CE. However, the damage had already been done. By the end of the war, uh, approximately 400 settlers had died. Maine's fishing economy was devastated. It would not be repaired and recover for decades to come. And the Wabanaki maintained their power and influence in eastern and northern Maine. <laughs> Which leads us to the next section of the video, the aftermath of King Philip's War. <laughs> so, of course, the first thing we're going to look at when examining the aftermath of King Philip's War is the casualties of King Philip's War. 
Now, obviously, the uh, group that was most affected by the ending of the events of and the ending of King Philip's War were the Native Americans. But uh, first, we're going to look at the English because they were the ones who began to suffer first at the beginning. Um, with 52 English towns having been attacked, a dozen destroyed, and around 30% of the English population, roughly 2,500 people, dying. Uh, the English population of New England dying. <laughs> with Plymouth Colony alone losing around 8% of its male population and a smaller percent of its uh, woman and child population. But of course, as I said just a couple of minutes ago, uh, the Native Americans were the ones who were affected the most and the most egregiously, uh, with over 5,000 Native Americans dying in battle, 3,000 dying of either sickness or starvation, and another 1,000 being sold into slavery and transported to British-controlled islands in the Caribbean, such as Jamaica and Barbados, uh, as well as non-British markets such as Spain and Portugal. <laughs> And the consequences of this conflict were uh, the New England natives were decimated, with many fleeing north to seek refuge with the Wabanaki and other tribes, which of course would lead to future Native American attacks on New England being from the north. Uh, conflict would continue for decades in Maine, New Hampshire, and northern Massachusetts, with six wars being started over the next 74 years between France and New England as well as the respective Native allies, with uh, one of the largest and longest lasting being King William's War, uh, which started in 1689 CE. <clears throat> and the defeat of Native forces in the South would eventually lead to the expansion of colonial settlements, though immediately after the war, the English only controlled a thin strip of land near the Atlantic coast. <clears throat> uh, by far the longest lasting consequence of this conflict would be the idea, uh, the ever-growing idea of Native Americans as a dangerous specter, um, which was only made worse by uh, things called captivity narratives that were written by English, taken as, captive by, as captives by Natives. Uh, uh, and this contributed, of course, as I said, to increasingly developing views by New Englanders that natives needed to be exterminated. Uh, which, in consequence of that, colonial towns would begin to develop, develop personal militias to protect themselves. Uh, there had been colonial militias, but these had been rather for like militias developed by the by various colonial confederations, like the New England Confederation. Uh, and uh, also, uh, having received no help from New England, New Englanders decided that they were on their own. Little to no help from New Eng from England. New Englanders decided that they were on their own and started to feel that they have their own identity and started wanting to separate from the English. Now, you might be asking, well, Dane, why isn't that the longest lasting consequence of King Philip's War. It's like, well, it only lasted up until the, you know, the end of the American Revolution. This right here, the idea that Native Americans were dangerous and needed to be exterminated, lasted up to, through, and then well after the uh, end of King Philip's War. <laughs> and here is a picture of the various Native Americans being shipped to slavery. And here's a picture of the most famous captive narrative uh, that was published after King Philip's War, that being the uh, uh, biography or captive narrative of Mary Rowlandson, which of course she omitted a lot of things uh, due to not wanting to be seen as a traitor to Christianity. <clears throat> now this leads us to our last section, where are the Native Americans who participated in this war today? Well, despite uh, you know, despite attempts by colonists uh, to wipe out, uh, wipe them out, as well as continued attempts by to this day by the U.S. to eliminate uh, Native American culture and wipe it out, uh, the various Native American tribes 
still persist, uh, persist to this day. Uh, for example, here are the Wampanoag, who still reside in New England uh, and have kept their culture strong, despite, again, continued to this day attempts by the U.S. government to erase their culture. The same goes for the Narragansett, who also continue to hold on to their culture uh, to this day in New England. Uh, and as well as the descendants of the Wabanaki, uh, such as the Abenaki, who are a subset of the Wabanaki, uh, and the pos uh, and the uh, and I apologize if I butcher this, uh, Possum uh, Quoti tribe, uh, who also still hold on to their culture. And all of these tribes are either federally recognized, state recognized, or both. <laughs> so as you can see, uh, these tribes, despite having in both won and lost this war, uh, and suffering greatly because of this war, uh, and because of the uh, actions of colonists can continue to persevere to this day. <laughs> All right, so that ends the fourth video in my series on the earliest large-scale conflicts between Native Americans and European colonists in North America, and the sixth video and sixth video in my early colonial debacles that disprove the myth of inherent European moral and technological superiority series, which as you can see in this video, this conflict definitely fits that criteria. <laughs> so with that, uh, if you want to see me cover any of the subjects mentioned in this video in later videos, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. I hope you enjoyed the video, and remember to like, share, and subscribe, and you all have a good day.